For 15 years, I was teaching with that model in all my syllabi, read, reflect, display, and do, but I didn't realize it was RRDD or R2D2. And so we wrote an article and then we wrote a book on this. And so that book came out in 2008 with John Wiley and it has 100 activities in that, just like the, the new book has 100 activities, but it's simpler. This model is much simpler. Uh, and uh, we, we embed an index of degree of time, risk, and cost. Low risk, high risk, low time, high time, low cost, high time, and then student-centered or instructor-centered. We list that, and we also list the objectives, we list the description, we list variations, because there's at least one variation for each activity, it actually has 200 or more activities in the book, it's that one too. Uh, we have at least one variation in, in each, so there's actually between the two books more than 400 ideas you can do in teaching online. So look at these books as pedagogy books with frameworks, with ways of making sense of the world. Now, has anyone heard, uh, got a copy of my World is Open book? Some of you might have seen it. It has 10 trends that spell we all learn. I like mnemonics. 10 trends in education that spell we all learn, whether it's e-books or mobile learning or or virtual worlds. It's a way of making sense of the trends. The World is Open is a big picture book for your administrators. These books are more for people teaching online, so they go hand in hand. Big picture, what's going on around the world, and then what can we do in the trenches of teaching with all this stuff? How can we make sense of what's available? So this model was purposely sort of built, and this book was purposely put together to help instructors uh, overcome resistance, maybe, or their uh, tension from having so much or whacking them every day, and some look at it as a learning style kind of model. Addressing diverse learners is the way we look at it. Uh, we look at it as a problem-solving wheel to address diverse learners of this world. We have a lot of diversity. Okay. And as you see, I used to dress up when I had a night outfit, and I had a real, I have a real lightsaber, and just didn't make it through the airport here. I got on eBay for 150 US dollars. Um, you too can have one if you want. Uh, and uh, as Mark knows, I sometimes used to. Well, there's a story behind this one we can't quite get into, but let's just say it was very humorous one day when I was at a conference and I had my lightsaber and she said, the man who just rose with a giant tool. Anyhow, um, she, she had a, there was a lady in front of us who had a tool belt and all sorts of, it was a pretty funny little video. Anyhow, that um, model, R2-D2, is a problem-solving wheel. Reading, reflecting, displaying, and doing. Problem orientation, problem clarification, solution analysis, and, and evaluation. It's a, it's, a, it, it's a wheel of this direction. 25 activities here, 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 and here are 100 total. Now you can start with doing and you can go in the other direction. You don't have to go in this starting with reading. You don't have to go with reflection. You don't have to go with visualization. You can go in any direction. It was just one way to make sense of the web. One one way to divide the web up into four things you can do. Simplify the web because today there's so much everyone wants us to do and they're asking for us to do. They're, they're recommending that we try out. Now the new book has ten principles of motivation. It's a little more complex but in some ways some people find that book um, to, to be a better instructional design kind of perspective. Some like this model. I have about 50-50. Some resonate better with this one, some resonate more with that one. Um, with the newer book, you do not have to use all 10 principles of motivation to have an impact, uh, nor do you have to use all four of these you know, parts of the problem-solving wheel. So reading, auditory learners, verbal learners, reflective learners, visual, hands-on, and hands-on learners, four parts. Verbal learning. Now, I was standing next to this guy at a conference in Austin last year, and I didn't realize it was the guy, Jory LaForge from uh, Star Trek, but I was standing right next to him. He didn't have his visor on, you know. So, verbal learners, auditory learners. Okay, Captain Picard. So, what can we do? Verbal learners, text based learners. One of the things that some instructors are doing is having students do oral histories, collecting oral data, verbal data, in the community. Uh, there's a tool out there that's free called Meograph that lets students collect oral histories. There are a number of websites out there, including one from uh, the Public Broadcasting Service, which I didn't queue up. It's 
doesn't take long to cue these up. Let's see if I can get this. This is a little timeline of slavery in the United States and what they did here. It's very fascinating. What they had were slaves, former slaves, grandsons of slaves, granddaughters, and sons. In 1924-ish, they interviewed them, like 60 years after having been freed or whatever, and those oral files, those audio files, were now embedded in a timeline of what slavery was like from around the 1800s. Now, back in the 1700s, they don't have, but they have pictures, they have text, all sorts of maps, an interactive timeline that they had collected in PBS, our public broadcasting system, put together using those kind of audio files. So, so collecting stories in your community. Another thing you can do is podcast shows, as I mentioned earlier, audio files, text-based files, podcast shows, blogging, in effect, becomes text online. We're a very text-centered society, in a way. The web was full of text in 1999. Today, it's more video. We're moving in that direction. Some use Twitter. Some people might ask me how to use Twitter in a class, and there's a website called Twitter for Education. I could click on this link, and you'll see that Twitter for Education has hundreds of uses of Twitter in your classroom, how you might use it. As it says there, project brainstorming, sharing online resources, uh, and so forth and so on. If you go to my set of activities, you can get uh, different, um, you can get a listing of how to use Twitter in education. You might have um, uh, publicizing events in Twitter, publishing and sharing links of published work, connecting students around the world in Twitter. Now, I have a Twitter account, and I'll be honest, I use it once in a while. I'm not a big Twitter user. Some of you may be. Um, you don't not have to use all these tools uh, in your own instruction. I use Facebook. I have many friends, but I don't use it for instruction. Others do. How many of you have a Twitter account? How many use Twitter in instruction? Nobody. How many have a Facebook account? How many of you are my Facebook friend? Um, you just, yeah, yeah. How many of you use Facebook for instruction? How do you use it for instruction? So you have discussion forums. Hmm. In history, what kind of history? Uh, history of wars is fine. Oh yeah, okay, interesting, yeah, fascinating. So, you know, these are social media tools uh, that some instructors do embed. Uh, I use this tool, simple tool, online you know, crossword puzzles and practice exams. I might print these out and bring them to a face-to-face -face class in blended learning. So there, there's a free tool. You can create a little hangman game, cross, crossword puzzle, double crossword puzzle, all sorts of things to just know if you know the content. Grammar checkers. So a whole suite of tools for grammar checkers on the web today, for especially my international students that want to know if they're using passive voice or active voice or using the wrong spelling of a word. Uh, some of these are free, some you have to pay for. Uh, Ginger, Grammarly, hello. Uh, Paper Raider, Spell Check Plus, so forth. There are many tools out there that you can use and embed in your class. Uh, and, you know, students feel more confident having an automated grading system or test and may check their papers before the instructor grades it and, and rates it and so forth. Text based learning. Facebook, there's a number of ways to use Facebook in a class. Uh, Museums, connecting students to local international museums, following po politicians, having students, in fact, Twitter, you can follow people in Twitter, follow celebrities, follow people in the field that have a, you know, a, a, a Twitter account. Uh, ask for, instead of trusting Wikipedia, ask the crowd on Facebook. Uh, one kindergarten teacher asked parents to, to uh, research seeds and got great information on the world's largest seed in the world, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. You know, so different things you can put up, questions you can put up on Facebook. Um, Games you can play in Facebook. Flashcards. Flashcards you can put up in Facebook. I don't trust you, Q. Okay. Um, so number two, observation online. Interactive observation. Some of you might remember the old show Star Trek. And you notice I'm mixing models. I have an R2D2 model and I have Star Trek in here, not Star Wars. That's why I no longer dress the part. Mm. Uh, reflect, observe, watch, part two of the model. Judgments, okay? So you might have an internship, you might have a practicum, you might have a field experience, you might have something where the students are trying the concepts out, out in the field and reflecting on what's beneficial, what, you know, what, uh, what concepts they're seeing in action, what principles they're seeing in action, what guidelines they're seeing in action, what they're missing, 
uh, and reflect on, you know, is my field experience really connecting to the book I just read? Is it connecting to my class? I've been doing this since 97, and the benefit of a field reflection is that one student might have a bad field experience or a, an, um, something inappropriate may have happened in the field experience, and they might see that the rest of the students in the class had sound, uh, you know, important, uh, meaningful field experiences. And, and often a student will, will generalize from their one poor experience that this is not the field for me. I'm going to give up on the field now, you see. By having a field reflection that's public for the class, you can read each other's comments. So one benefit is to say that, you know, maybe it's, I shouldn't give up yet on this field. Maybe I need to have just ask for a different placement, be moved if I can, or wait till next time. The second thing it does is as an instructor, you can see if they're all missing the same concept. So what I'll do in summarizing, I'll summarize what they got correct, and then after that, I'll point out what they're missing. I start with some of the positives first. Now, I team taught with a guy who only started with negatives. And let me tell you, when you start with only negatives every time, the students get a little tense. So I try and start with their names. I say who they are, who caught some main concepts, so and so. And then I move to some of the negative side of what, what they missed. I might point out what, what, what else they should look for next time when they go back in the field. Okay? So, and I misspelled, looks like something. Big issue reflections. A new website I found is called B. QO, Big Questions Online. And this website has questions like, can you control your mind? What makes us generous? What's the difference between knowledge and understanding? Well, what are the implications for a free will debate for individuals in society? Can we teach gratitude early in life? These are big questions. I now in Moodle have my students post big questions for our field, for our topic, for our course. Each person has one week where they're posting the big questions and everyone else has to respond to them. I'm fostering reflection. I generally have not done a good job as an instructor in this part too. Reflection, debriefing, the most, one of the most powerful aspects of learning is the reflective part or the clarification explanation part. We have to explain to each other what you learned. You have to reflect on what you didn't get. This is a way to frame reflections or debriefing in your class. Timelines online. Timelines online can help you visualize and understand what it is that you, you're learning in the class. Now when Steve Jobs died, that day, there's a timeline of his life, and my students in new technologies class could reflect on the changes in technologies over his lifespan and our lifespans. And as we scroll along the Steve Jobs timeline, you can see the technologies that he brought to bear for all of us and um, Pixar. I'm currently listening to a book from Pixar founder called Creativity Inc. But this timeline is a media element. And the, the Guardian here in the UK, the Chronicle of Higher Education in the US, the New York Times, the Washington Post, they have many media elements that we can use in the class. Be aware of them. Read the paper and it says media element available online. Go online and find it. That, you know, if you're, you know, when I'm reading the paper, it often will say there's more information online. Go and find it. You might find ways to use some of these things in your classes themselves. Uh, if I click on um, Martin Luther King Memorial, I've been to the Stone of Hope a couple of times now. This came Oh, about two years ago, I guess, this uh, Stone of Hope was, a was uh, announced. Now, there's a quote in there they had to change if, you're not, you know, if you haven't been reading about this. But this has a timeline of Martin Luther King's life. Okay? It's a fascinating place to go on a blue sky day because this white stone is just gorgeous. Uh, if you look above it, uh, just the blue sky juxtaposed against Martin Luther King is fascinating. So media elements, again, if I go, um, I'm not sure if this one will work, but this is... Um, Harrison Ford and his life as an actor. You'll see a lot of these kind of, uh, of websites out there and it doesn't want to quite uh, do what I want to do. Come on, get out of the way. <laughs> Why is it doing that to me? Anyhow, let me try this again. Well, I'll, I'll just explain then that <laughs> it's never done that to me before that this will have an index or a video of his life, a timeline of his life. It's kind of fascinating to look at. So timelines, and there you can see what the movies he's been across his life. But Steve, uh, when, when Bill Gates retired, they had a timeline of his life. So again, in my technology class, I could have students reflect on technology changes over, over their lifespans. This is Steve Jobs. Tech, you know, so virtual timelines with media. Now there are tools that your students can build timelines with. One of them is used a lot, called Dippity. This one's from MIT called Simile. X Timeline also. These three tools, uh, particular X Timeline and Dippity, are tools where students can build timelines. And this is a way to force them to reflect on the content. This is a way to force them to reflect on what they've learned a bit um, and, to, and to create a, a, an overview. 
Uh, and I often will have them print out their timelines, bring them to class, circle the concepts in there, let's discuss them, let's kill a tree or two. Well, we shouldn't have to always save trees. Let's kill one or two along the way because paper actually is pretty important because you can bring it, you can highlight it, you can circle it, you can discuss it, you can post it. I'm, I'm, I'm all for saving trees, but we, we save a few too many nowadays. Paper still has a role if you're teaching a blended class or a face-to-face -face class. This is one way. When students do a timeline, I have my students put huge timelines on the floor in my rooms. They bring to class, you know, and roll them out, and we have discussions and debates around them and so forth. Now, you can do that online, of course, too. One of my friends I went to grad school with, Kim Foreman, had a blog called ComeAndSeeAfrica.com. Her and her husband did missionary work in Africa. In fact, I dedicate the book to her. You'll see her picture at the beginning. You'll see her picture with her husband throughout. You'll see her picture with Rwandan uh, people in a Bible study program. She had a website called ComeAndSeeAfrica.com, but three, four years ago, you'll see now it's uh, be four years ago, July 2010, uh, her last post was made, and there she was in Rwanda with these kids. There's a picture you saw. She has videos. She has pictures. She has uh, text and all sorts of reflections. Um, but she gave up the last seatbelt to someone sitting next to her in the, in, the, in the Jeep, and she got thrown from the Jeep and died a couple days later. Uh, she was my big sister, and uh, sort of, in a way, she called herself my big sister, and I talked to her class at San Francisco State every year. She talked to my class. Very sad, but her blog's still up to, to talk about you know, what's like in Rwanda. Her blog's reusable. Think about what you're putting up online that might be used five years, 10 years, 100 years after you're gone. 200 years, 300 years, and so forth. So cultural blogs, things of the, you know, reflect, reflect, reflect on content. Now, I have my students matched up as critical friends. I mentioned that earlier. They match up so they give each other feedback, advices, you see. Because I can't give feedback on everything my students post or I would die. So I have critical friends who give each other feedback. Everyone wants feedback online. Information graphics, infographics today have exploded. And remember earlier I mentioned you had a question. It was a different question. I answered the wrong question, sorry. But she was asking about, you know, are there countries in the world that are formerly in developing parts of the world that are pushing ahead online and outstripping what's being done in the traditional developed world? I, I didn't answer the right question. I, I would point out that maybe Thailand, uh, definitely Korea, I mean, Korea, 50 years ago was number 239 in GDP in the world. Now it's in the top 20, but that was already happening before, well, in sync with, with uh, web-based instruction. What other countries are, are India is pushing ahead in web to some degree, but it depends on po what part of the country. So not, it's not across the entire country as we talked about earlier. Um, so the infographic, you see with 60% males online, 28, about age 28, 73% have a full-time job, 68% have a bachelor's degree, typically in science and technology and applied sciences and social sciences. And they're typically in uh, the first week or two and dropping out, they're not engaging. These infographics give you a visual, they give you a big picture, you can see things there. Number three is visual learners, part three, flow charts, timelines, pictures, films, and taxonomies. So displaying your learning online. Let's see if I have a little audio phone. How is it that the cube can handle time and space so well and us so badly? Perhaps someday we will discover that space and time are simpler than the human equation. Okay, so let's stop for a second. I've gone through two parts of the R2-D2 model. I've got your greens, your yellows, your pinks are in front of you. And the greens, you see, I wanted you to write down what are things you can use. Now, you might have already forgotten what I've gone through, so let me just back through, back through what I've already discussed. Blogging, infographics, timelines, reflections, uh, field experiences, Facebook, grammar checkers, crossword puzzles, Twitter, podcasts, interactive stories. Just stop for a second on your greens, on your yellows, on your pinks. Some idea that maybe you can use in green, you might use in yellow, you won't use in red or pink. Let's go ahead and write that down on there, and I'll be back in a second for part three of the R2-D2 model. Uh, 
students have gone through the program already come back as mentors for the ones that have, you know, uh, if they want something on their resume as a teaching aide and have them be in charge of scanning those documents for incorrect information and flag it in some ways and, you know, it could be in effect crowdsourcing from your budding expertise of next year programs. Now, the University of Michigan had all their dentistry program put up online in a podcast format as a supplemental. So you could check that, having those podcasts from the experts, from the instructors up online to compare against what you're, you're, uh, you're getting in the online discussions. So that was, that was the University of Michigan's solution to that. Um, you've seen some of that. Is it pretty good? It's a bit dated, I think. It's getting dated. Yeah, it is. It, it came out about seven years ago, I think, now. But there might be newer programs. That's, that is the other the common question. What happens with OER, Open Ed? Uh, when it gets dated, who updates it? Who sustains it? Where's the money coming from to upgrade it? That is a common critique and, and an issue. Uh, even in these timelines, you're up to 2014. What happens in 2020? Who puts in the gap? You know, so you know, that's, a, that's a common issue. And what happens with YouTube videos that come down? So when I show, when I have videos on B.F. Skinner and psychology, I have a backup plan. I have six videos queued up, ready to go if case one goes down. That's a solution that I have for that. Now, in terms of podcasts that get old, uh, that the you know, solution for that actually is I have my students um, who every every week I have a different solution. Uh, student gets five minutes of fame up in front that shows us something that I I don't have in the class, some resource that they found. And you might have an assignment where they have to find podcasts from other universities on dentistry that, you know, you're using the students to find stuff, share it, demonstrate it, present it. They're getting presentation skills, they're getting search skills, critical thinking skills. They might look for the you know, quality issues and so forth. So I'm a student as a cool resource provider. Everyone does that once and they find stuff that I didn't know existed. Yeah, so you know, you're using, you're using the students in the class, give them some points, you know, and so forth. But that is a way to find out about what's there. And Merlot is another way. Just as I said, go to Merlot, type in the, they have a medical section, or you know, type in the search box, uh, you know, podcast and dentistry, and you'll see if there's something newer than Michigan. So that's another solution. There are other portals like that available. There's the OER Commons, for instance, that tries to index all the classes online and so forth. You know, when you go to a restaurant, there's, in the U.S. we have Yelp. You can find out the quality of food. They're now building websites to look at quality of online courses. Uh, so, you know, rate my course kind of websites, crowdsourced around contents. Other comments, Mark? I was just going to observe that I, I wonder actually putting stuff online is just exposing some of the risks that happen already because students will of course talk to each other in any case and possibly give them inappropriate advice. So, mm. you know, I think going online is just exposing the risks a little more, which is helpful because we then have to work through what the risks are mm. and what we might do if a student posts something that's in, either inappropriate or unprofessional or an unhelpful suggestion. I, I don't actually see it as something new. It's just mm. a different risk that we need to think more about. You know, there's a study that was done on a technique a long time ago called reciprocal teaching where students become the teachers of the content and they have to teach each other they're using summarization skills, prediction, clarification and so forth, metacognitive skills and reading. They were able to increase students comprehension rate from 30 to 80 percent. They studied this uh, for a long period of time at the University of Illinois in the Center for the Study of Reading and found students were giving incorrect data about the field, but their, metacognitive, their comprehension skills were still going up. The factual skills weren't always correct, but their metacognitive, their planning skills, their submonitoring skills went up, and their overall test scores went up. So it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. If we're only focusing on the facts, you forget about the explanation thereof, having to, having to put it in your own pithy words. There's some skills being learned from that that are very, very critical. So it's, it's kind of a quandary that we're in. What's that? Teaching your thinking. Teaching your thinking skills. You're teaching how to reflect, how to synthesize, how to paraphrase, how to clarify and add to other comments. So there's many aspects of this. That we, yes, we want to have the facts correct, but we also want the higher level thinking skills, the lots, lower order thinking, and the hots, higher order thinking. We want both. I want both. I'm an accountant. I want more is more, you know. Some people just focus on the higher order, some focus on the low. I want both, personally. So well, let's look back here at part three, online display, displaying your learning, online art. There's a, a website Google's built uh, for, called the Google Art Project, where you can you know, go to the uh, Museum of Modern Art or to the Van Gogh Museum in the Netherlands. Uh, not the Louvois, so the only one that was not in there when I last checked, but you can create your own little exhibits as a, as a learner and share them and so forth. An interesting website. Now, our national news in the U.S., 
for Brian Williams, had it highlighted in the news one day when I presented this to my students. My students went home that night and he's showing the same thing I showed them that day. Like, wow, you know, it's got like all those clicking things. If you've not seen this, uh, you should check this out. It's called, you know, Wordle. Wordle's a tool. There are many others, Tagzito, Taggle, Wordsit, where you can visualize words. My students put my curriculum, my assignments, my syllabi in Wordle, and up comes the words that I'm using too much or too little, and they post it on my door of my office after they get their grades, and they say, Dr. Bonk, you're using this word too much in your syllabus. They actually made a really fancy poster for me after they got their grades. Um, the brave ones come before class, before the grades. So, yeah, but Wordle is a tool to visualize words. So you're getting part one, you know, in the R2D2 model, and part three from these Word, Wordle and How many of you have used these or have seen these? used. Interesting, I mean, I'm, I'm using them occasionally for students to put their discussion forums and comments in a, this format, post uh, and, br and print it, bring it to class and let's discuss your discussion. You can print out your normal discussions and you can print out the Wordle version of your discussions. Uh, maps, this is an interactive map from the Chronicle of Higher Education in the U.S. showing College degrees from 1940 to 2009, as you look, not many people, 3.7% of people in North Carolina had a college degree back in 1970. As we flip across the map to the 2008-9, you can see, let's look at that again. This is a significant eye-opener for the politicians who say, you know, we don't have enough kids getting degrees. There's a big change that's happened. It's a big, you know, it's a huge infrastructure issue on, in our country, uh, trying to increase constantly the number of people getting a college degree. Uh, now we have the Obama administration trying to get a national skills library to get every kid two years of free college and to finish their secondary schools. Um, that hasn't passed. The Republicans have beaten him up on many things, including that. He wants to create an online portal or resource of all introductory college classes to help everyone get that first two years of college. Anyways, an interactive map like this, a timeline map like this, are powerful for learning. This one here, if you remember um, Sandy Hook, some of you remember Sandy Hook, if you click on this from the, this little website from the um, Huffington Post, and you click the next button, what the next button will show is by day, gun violence in the US, uh, and in red, by city, and so if I click here, this is gun violence, and if we go to the bottom, it'll show us by day. That's the number of people being killed uh, on the axis. So another way to visualize our gun problem, our senators who in the NRA who are not voting on any of this stuff. Um, so reflections on these maps, reflections on the words we use, reflections on uh, the questions that we have. Um, visualizing data, you asked earlier about third world countries and this map shows us people enrolling in the free classes from Harvard and MIT. Uh, they're coming from North America and Russia and China to some degree and Australia, not as many from Africa. If we look by um, age and gender, and this is kind of small print here unfortunately, so this, this one here is on the certificates people are getting from the free contents. Most are coming from Russia and Canada and Australia getting certificates in southeastern parts of Africa. This one here is looking at, I believe it is, um, education. So in blue here are people with uh, college degrees about 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60% of people in North Africa who are taking these online courses already have a college degree. We're not helping people in North Africa who don't have a college degree. Here in green we have female, male population and the, the uh, lighter the green the more yellow and orange it gets the more females taking these courses. You can see heavily male dominance in online classes uh, that are free. So math help us visualize information, help us serve as a point of reflection in effect out there. These, this is a website created about two months ago um, that I found in the USA Today and reading the paper you find all sorts of things. So when I went off to Thailand, when I went off to Vietnam, I was reading about deforestation in parts of you know, southern uh, parts of Thailand and um, parts of Vietnam and reforestation, if that's the proper word for that. They look at uh, changes over time. Interesting website. Uh, map interpretations. Another one that came up about the same time is one on surging seas showing what, how we would be impacted if the seas rose by six inches, eight inches and so forth and they 
they kind of indicate where the washout. Uh, this website is called sealevel.climatecentral.org. Uh, if you teach the, uh, an environmental science class or something to that effect, this might be a site you use, that might be a site you use in your classes. If you teach clinical education, you might embed video in your classes. As people are doing at SKKU University in Korea, they have a lot of clinical training through video uh, formats in their classes. Animations, there's a lot of new discoveries made from this one website called Foldit. Foldit's a tool to show proteins unfolding over time and actually help you understand AIDS and Alzheimer's and other things. And this is a tool that can be crowdsourced so people can make little discoveries and they add up over time. So actually new discoveries in science are being made from this one simulation created at Stanford. And this simulation is free online, again showing proteins unfolding over time. Now I'm not an expert in this field, so that's the limitation of my knowledge. Uh, those, some of you may know more about how to utilize some of these tools. In fact, maybe we should talk about that is how do you see the use of some of these tools here uh, in your own fields and environments, whether it's virtual microscopes to understand uh, cancerous growth or you know, gastric bypass surgery or whatever you're, you're trying to understand, uh, or um, simple online visual library searches. A year ago, a new library emerged in the U.S. called the Digital Public Library of America. And this Digital Public Library of America is kind of interesting because it has ways to display your search on an interactive timeline, if you will. So as we, um, as I would type in, here's timeline here. If I type in a search term, if someone gives me a search term, I don't know what to search for. Give me a search term. Anyone? Nothing? Civil war. Civil war. Okay, civil war. We'll see if I can type properly. So civil war documents. This will indicate, so the libraries have from, and you can see the different years here, 1959 or 85 documents that, you know, are, came out, that's the year of publication, okay? So it has on this timeline uh, a number of media elements. Now we can shorten up, instead of a decades view, we might get different kinds of view, and this is going by decades. We gotta go back to the 1800s, and of course there's gonna be many more documents. So every, this, this has, and if we click on 1923, up will come the different items from that year that were made available. Um, you notice that uh, Georgia, you notice that, uh, uh, click in here, it will give you the uh, date created, the contributing partner, it will actually give you the media element. You can click on it and see the element itself, view the object. What was that object? It might be just a text document, it might be a picture, it might be a book, it might be something else. So they're trying to index history in this one website called the Digital Public Library of America, okay? Visualizing it on a timeline. Uh, and so here's an example of it on a timeline. I typed in computers, and so you can see uh, from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and so forth. Timelines of U.S. presidents. A number of websites exist for that, and as you click along the timeline, you can get different information on different presidents or prime ministers or whatever you have. Uh, TV Lesson, this is a website uh, like the BBC video site and TED Talks. This is a, a website to learn how to fix your mobile phone if it falls in the toilet, which I had to do recently. Um, don't want to tell you how that happened, but uh, you know, we'll tell you how to shoot a bow and arrow, how to interview for a job, how to write a resume, uh, all sorts of things at TV Lesson. Uh, use a digital camera, whatever the task, how to use a camera here to film in this room. Medical animations, the web is full of medical animation, uh, animations, including what I mentioned earlier, gastric bypass surgery or heart murmurs or something else. Now, not something I want wish on anybody anytime soon, but the medical field has developed really interesting and, and uh, educationally sound videos and animations that are available for free in, in YouTube and TeacherTube and medical tube. there's medical tube. Um, finally, part four, kinesthetic learners. And so he says he only had one chance to save them now. And uh, he comes back and he says, He's giving you the power. Well, I'm giving you the power of R2-D2. <laughs> we can reflect on it during lunchtime a little bit here, but um, go back here a second. So part four, role play, dramatization, cooperative games, simulations. Part four is doing something. Now my son likes this part, doing something. He doesn't want to read about it anymore. Kids today, they want to try it out first. So you might start with part four and go backwards in, in effect. 
So I developed a tool uh, called uh, SurveyShare uh, back about 10 years ago, like Zoomerang and SurveyMonkey. You may have heard of Zoomerang and SurveyMonkey. How many of you have ever used Zoomerang or SurveyMonkey? Or an online survey tool of some other, there's other ones, many other. I had SurveyShare um, and it's still up there, it's still free. I, 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 my, the boy genius who built it for me now owns the company. I don't want to do that stuff anymore. Uh, but there's a free version of all these things. Polling tools, MicroPoll, MrPoll, uh, where your students can do real-world data collection and analyze it, do Excel spreadsheets on it and graphs on it and all sorts of things. Collect data in the hallways during break time and come back and have it on display later on or during the week, collect data in the streets of, of London and so forth. So survey research and market analysis, doing something, getting their hands dirty, surveying, in my case, teachers in the field about problems of integrating technology, whatever, the, you know, using iPads or something. Class documentaries, some of my students tell me, Dr. Bonk, your assignments are too easy. I want to do something harder. I want to create a documentary of this class for next year's class to use, to understand the complexities of this class. I had a student from Uzbekistan. she said, Dr. Bonk, every semester you say, Dr. Bonk, I want to do something harder. I'm like, wow. So you know you got them when they're all coming up to you saying, I want to try something more difficult. She did a wonderful job. And I can use this, of course, in six years it might be too old, but for five years it'll be very relevant. Another student said, Dr. Bonk, I don't want to just do a paper for this class. I want to write a book. Not a long book, but a relatively short book. And this book's going to be made available at BookRicks as a mobile book for anyone to download. This is a nice idea. She was a student in my online class. I teach both face-to-face -face and online, but there are a number of books up at BookRicks, some which are for sale, some which are free. Uh, so publishing services are free, in, in fact, uh, up here, and uh, if, you, if you sell them, you split your royalties with them, I guess, but she put this up there, it was a couple of years ago, it's a free little book about the uh, mobile learning and education, I think it was. Another student said to me, Dr. Bunk, I want to create a mobile app to help students understand this course. It's okay uh, to help understand the history of technology and education. He created a little mobile app that students could download and understand new technologies, which I was teaching him. So I teach new technologies and psychology at Crossover. Another student said, Dr. Buck, I'm using Prezi, and I want to show a, do a Prezi presentation. And this is a, you know, as a final recap of what I've learned in the class. And how many of you have seen Prezi or used Prezi's? I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. Um, that's for the um, for Mac people, right? Apple people, not PC, or is it PC as well? This PC as well. Did it start with the? Yep, looks like. Uh, I might have, let's try this one. Did it start with a Mac and then move to PC, or did it start with both? I'm not sure. It was just on a PC. Hmm. So this takes a while to load up, unfortunately. It's, um, what this does is summarizes his learning. So he walks us through each week of what he learned in my. Oh, he's got some music embedded in here, it sounds like. That's taking a little while to load that. So this is his final project, okay, and Jeff's going to show us what he's gathered from this class in his Prezi presentation. Okay, my course is called The Monster Syllabus. It's 75 pages long, and he embeds a video in here. It shows what he's gathered there, and then he goes on with some text that he's learned, blah, blah, blah. So a Prezi presentation is one way to summarize in, in, uh, in the, uh, your learning in a pithy way. Now this student did a music video. He summarized all the psychology theorists out there that he was learning in my intro to, to learning theory in three different kinds of musical genres. Now he wrote a reflection paper around this, which was what I graded. I graded the video as well, but he wrote a reflection on what he learned in my class, a summary. He got a little creative here. I don't actually teach math, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, my students do YouTube videos of what they learned in my classes. Some do oral histories. They collect data in the real com world community and summarize their learning there. Doing something, podcast shows, doing something, books, doing something, wiki books. Um, what else do I have here? Oh, you've heard of Pinterest? Someone heard of Pinterest? How many of you have a Pinterest account? How many of you use your Pinterest account? Actually know what it means. 
I, I sign up for Pinterest just to try and get a sense of what it does. And people follow me. I got a thousand people. I don't use it at all. I have no clue what Pinterest is. You know, and I get a kick every time. I'm like, there's some people following you on Pinterest. I have no clue. But Learnist is a way for you to create your, ex put your expertise on display, put a course on display for others to learn from you, in effect. So my students might create a Learnist course, in effect. My students might do podcast shows. One of my students did a podcast show on the future of the libraries. And about a month later, a president of a small college, a Christian college in the middle of uh, in, in Illinois, came to visit me outside my door. He's waiting for me. I was late for the meeting. He comes in, he goes, we want to create the library of the future at Greenville College. Would you consult with us? I said, I don't consult much. I really don't. But I have the perfect person for you because she's in the IU library, Indiana University library. She just did a podcast show on the future of libraries. So I was able to connect them together. She got some consulting out of it. He got someone who's an expert at it. There was a, you know, so your student projects might be usable beyond your class, in effect. You know? She did a marvelous job. You just don't know where these things can lead. It might be a follow-on next semester. If they take your class again, they might build on it and do something else with it. So podcast shows, books, documentaries of the course, video summaries. OK, so that's the R2-D2 model. Read, reflect, display, and do. Uh, some prefer tactile, hands-on, some, I'm a visual person, some are reflective, some want to read. If I was to poll you and you had to pick your top style or per, per preference for learning, would you pick reading, reflecting, displaying, or doing? Who would pick reading or auditory learning in here? Who would pick reflection, reflective learners in here? Huh. Who would pick visual learning, displaying or learning, and hands-on learning if you were to pick one? And who likes all four? <laughs> okay, Simon was having a difficulty putting his hand up for any one in particular. Uh, so we have 25 activities embedded in there for each, one, each part of there, and a total of 100, as I mentioned earlier. So how many of you think this model is useful? Might use it? Tech variety might be useful? Who got at least zero ideas? No, who got at least one idea this morning from the sessions? Two or more? Three or more? How many got at least four ideas this morning? Okay, what I'd like to do before we go off to lunch is two things. One, I'd like you to go back to your, your sheets and just, which of these ideas did you resonate with? Let me go flip back through these again. So, podcast shows, Learnist, oral histories, YouTube summaries, Prezi presentations, mobile apps, mobile books, documentaries, market analysis, animations, videos, timelines, map projections, data visualization, Wordle, online art, those are some of the things I mentioned. Which of those might you find a role? Okay, at your tables again, share your greens, your yellows, your pinks, and your three words with people at your table, and I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to walk around and hear what your three words are. <laughs> yeah, models help. Uh, frameworks help. Uh, models, ideas, solutions. You know, these technologies will come and go. The, many of these things, if I come back next time, they'll be gone. Some of these things might have been mentioned the last time I was here, but we move on. The model will stay. The R2-D2 model I've been using for a long time, and it's, it holds some water. I don't want to, there are other models besides mine. I don't want to just say mine's the model to use. There are, we mentioned in the book, there are many other models out there uh, and try them out, but models and frameworks help have a staying power, you know, beyond all this. And so when something comes up in the news or something's mentioned in a department meeting to use, you can think about how it fits the model or the framework, you know, not just that we have to use this next thing. This iPad now has to be embedded in, or how are you embedding them in? So that's a really important point. Um, I've, a lot of you had similar comments on your three words, so maybe we should start with the three Three word takeaways that some of you have. Um, yours back there, or four words you had. Yes, it, they were. They are the R model actually. Read, display, reflect, and do. So she's got the R two D two models. Her takeaway from this, what'd you have? Uh, something for everyone. 
something for that's an important point too I, I haven't really focused on dentistry despite many people how many dentistry people we have in the room here is quite a few people in here uh, but yet there's still some things hopefully that you all can take away I wasn't aware that there'd be as many dentistry people uh, here or I would have been uh, online more in the in the field but uh, try and make some of these generic enough the, the the ideas in these books try to be generic enough that they can fit in many contexts and if they don't strip something away take something away from it and make it ad adapted to your field what do you have Education is moving global. A really important point I haven't even gotten to really today is the fact that global education, bringing people in from around the world, having student activities that are global to help people take perspectives of others. That's the really the main reason to use technology, at least for po folks like me in education and psychology, is to help perspective taking because we got enough problems of people who can't take perspectives around the world and it's causing a lot of civil dis disruption in many countries. So. You know, if we can start early and get kids to do projects with others, it's, it's, it's a really critical point. Other comments, three words. Ideas worth exploring. Okay, this is a, another important point. I had in here 15 minutes to explore. Maybe during lunchtime now, we can explore some of these sites. If you brought your iPad with you or your smartphone. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.